Well, good morning and thank you. It's, uh, it's a delight to be here in Scotland, and uh, it's also a delight to be the only one in the room without an accent. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to start off by acknowledging um, many of my colleagues from across the United States who've contributed in many ways both to my uh, education and to, uh, to this presentation. They say that stealing from one person is plagiarism, but as a university professor, I can tell you that stealing from many is scholarship. Um, so I want to acknowledge uh, Mike Overton and Jesse Goff. Uh, Mike was at the University of Georgia. Jesse's at Iowa State. Sandra God and Ricardo Chabelle are colleagues of mine at the University of Minnesota. And Mike Hutchins and Jim Drakeley are at the University of Illinois. So as you can see, I'm an uh, equal opportunity th uh, thief in terms of information. Uh, I want to talk about the transition program here this morning. Uh, there's various definitions of transition programs for dairy cattle. Uh, traditionally, it's been like the last three weeks of the dry period and early postpartum, but as we learn and study more about the transition program, we learn that, in fact, it's probably the, not even probably, it is the entire dry period and as much as a month postpartum that the cow goes through rather dramatic changes in her lifetime. Um, uh, another small warning, there's far more density on many of my slides than I can give justice to in the time allotted. There's a man back there with a very large hook who keeps mumbling HRH, as far as I can tell. I'm not sure what those initials stand for, but it's clear that I have a drop-dead deadline this morning to be done. Um, I did that deliberately. Uh, any of you who would like a copy of these slides in PDF form, uh, you can get them through CMEX. So I deliberately put more information into this slide set than I'm going to belabor in the time I have allotted for this morning. Uh, but anyway, the transition period is a period of very significant hormonal, metabolic, and immunologic, and physiologic changes in the cow. So it includes late pregnancy, so there's fetal growth involved, uh, parturition itself, and the, and the initiation of lactation, first colostrum genesis and then uh, milk genesis. Um, most of the negative events that occur in a cow's life happen in this period or are set up for this period, which I'll come back to at nauseum. Uh, much of the culling happens in this period or is set up during this period, and the cow may be culled at the end of her lactation, but she's now not pregnant or she's been a poor producer or something else has happened, largely because of what her experience was through the transition period. Um, lots of disease in the transition period. These are just... Uh, data plucked from a variety of sources. This is the national survey that's done of animal diseases in the United States. And so 1995, 2001, and 2007, and as you can see, we have retained placentas, we have milk fevers, and we have displaced abomasums. I realize that none of you who are dairymen in the room have those problems, but your neighbors do. So, <laughs> so I, I'm really hoping that you'll go back from today and, and, and sort of think of yourselves as an extension of this conference in terms of pulling up the performance of your neighboring dairies. Um, so if you look at it, depending on the source, the numbers waffle around a little bit, but they really don't change a great deal in terms of the incidence of these diseases across the, the uh, the industry as a whole, and they haven't changed significantly over time. In other words, we still, to a very significant degree, deal with the same general incidence or prevalence of those diseases. Um, onset of those diseases, if you look at it, the dark line across there is about 18 or 19 days postpartum, and you can see lots of these diseases going from left to right, milk fever, retained placenta, metritis, off-feed, LDA, um, plus minus however we're gonna define ketosis, but that's a long medical conversation we won't have this morning. Um, clinical mastitis, some degree of enteritis, all of those things are happening to the cows pretty shortly after calving. This is one I happen to work on a lot. We have a teaching facility at Minnesota. Uh, it's a consortium of three dairies, each of which milks 3,000 cows, but all of the transition events happen at the central dairy. So we calve about 10,000 cows a year at that dairy. and. Yes, we, in fact, we do have metritis, and if you look at when it occurs, very early postpartum, and, and this, the, you can't read the numbers, but it's from zero to 15 days on the right. Most of it, initial diagnosis of, of metritis is at less than five days. Um, di displaced abomasums happen in that transition period. Um, clinical mastitis happens 
obviously across all of the lactation, but certainly we have a significant peak in early lactation, as do many dairies. So they're all there. Lameness, not so strikingly clear that lameness happens in cows in early lactation. As you can see, this is across the whole lactation. There's a bit of a Russian roulette in terms of lameness, but I can tell you that a significant part of that lameness that's appearing later in lactation has been set up by events in the cow at and around calving. Um, so transition problems do not occur in isolation. It's not like cows get retained placenta and nothing else nor do they suffer poor fertility without any preceding events that happen in the transition period. In fact, all of these things, poor production, pneumonia, metritis, retained placenta, dystocia, ketosis, DAs, all of that stuff, all of them connect together a great deal. So transition problems are part of a very complex and interacting system where many factors affect the risk and the severity of the disease that you experience in your cows, excuse me, your neighbors experience on their cows, on their dairy. Um, so it's in many ways not particularly useful, although I will do it shortly, to think about diseases in isolation. You have to think about it as a system issue, and if you're going to address it, it can't be addressed at the individual cow level. It has to be addressed at the system level. And good management can very definitely deliver and deliberately reduce the incidence of problems in the transition period if you understand the underlying causes. So this slide stolen from Jesse Goff, a veterinary physiology person at Iowa State. Um, there's all kinds of interacting pieces to the system, and I don't expect for the moment that you read through that, but it's the three in the middle that I'm going to focus on because they are, if you will, the final common pathway to transition cow problems. And they are a negative energy balance and, in parentheses, probably in many dairies, negative protein balance, particularly metabolizable available protein uh, during the pre-fresh and early postpartum periods, immune suppression, and hypocalcemia. And those three final common pathways are key to understanding what happens to a cow and what happens that she adapts poorly to the transition and gets into trouble. So I'm going to start with the first of them, uh, negative energy balance in this case. Um, as you obviously know, energy is needed for maintenance of the animal itself in late pregnancy for fetal growth and lactogenesis, colostrogenesis and lactogenesis, and then ultimately lactation. But very, very important, energy is needed for the immune system. And that's often overlooked, but if any of you think about the last time you got the flu or you got the cold, the reason that you felt as bad as you did and as you, were, you were as listless as you were and you wanted to stay in bed is not because you didn't eat breakfast and there was no energy available. It's because a significant amount of your available energy was redirected to your immune system to fight the disease. In the absence of that energy, in a negative energy balance status, your immune system doesn't work as well. And so that's true of cows as, as, as well as us. It's true of all animals. So the, the result of the negative energy balance has significant impacts on the immune system, and it also has impacts in terms of fatty acid mobilization from fat stores in the cow, fat moves to the liver, fatty acid uh, accumulation or fat accumulation in fatty liver, ketone body production, ketosis. There's a whole cascade of negative energy balance effects low glucose, poor production, all of those things that are associated with negative energy balance. Um, this is a uh, graph of the supply of energy, the, the more white bars are the supply of glucose that the cow has from about 21 days prepartum to about 21 days postpartum. And these were cows in a study that were fed ad libitum, fairly high energy diets, which is to say, on the face of it, they were provided all the energy they wanted to eat or all the energy that they could uh, they could take in at, at, at libitum, at, at free choice. And you can see that prepartum, up until the last few days, the cow had more energy than she needed, excess glucose. And then after calving, she was significantly deficient in the amount of glucose she, she needed for all those functions of energy that they play a role for. Very important. To, to understand that I said she was provided prepartum as a dry cow all the energy she wanted to eat. That's probably, not probably, that is a mistake. And I will come back to that in a minute. 
So what's happening to dry matter intake, to feed intake in these cows in late pregnancy and coming into uh, early lactation? Fairly stable up until the last week or two before calving and then a very precipitous drop in most cows right in the last two or three days before calving. Very, very significant drop in dry matter intake and obviously if the cow is not eating as much, she's taking in less energy. What that means is that for her to deal with her energy needs, that she needs to have the physiologic mechanisms in place that allow her to mobilize energy from her own body stores. And those will come principally from two sources, because cows don't store a great deal of glucose. Muscle glycogen is a very small store in a cow. The two principal sources in a cow that's not eating enough at and around calving are a little bit, she will mobilize body protein and the liver will convert that and make some of the amino acids can be converted, deaminated and converted into glucose. So that's a glucose supply for her. Parenthetically, if she's low in, in protein in her diet, that's harder for her to achieve. But very significantly, she has to mobilize body fat and have the ability to take that body fat and use it for energy. And if not well adapted, if her physiologic systems are not up to speed, if you will, then she does that poorly, develops fatty livers, gets low energy, goes further off feed, develops ketosis, all the ramifications in terms of negative energy balance that happen from there. So it, it's sort of a vicious cycle because suppressed dry matter intake adds to low blood calcium, low calcium availability from the gut, and at the same time, the low availability from the gut drives calcium down even further. The best way we have to deal with this and to try to uh, prevent as much of this cascade of events as we can in cows is to keep them in slight metabolic acidosis because metabolic alkalosis, if they're a little bit too if they're not acid enough in their bloodstream, and we're talking subtle differences here, uh, 7.35 versus 7.3 or 7.45, um, slight acidosis improves the function of parathyroid hormone and improves the cow's ability to adapt and upregulate calcium into her bloodstream. Um, I got a slide stolen from Jesse Goff on this. It's been shown that the receptor that parathyroid hormone binds to in, in the bone that sets in the cascade of events that mobilizes calcium out of bones, it fits very well and it's very effective at a blood pH of 7.35 at as little as slightly less acidic, a little more basic bloodstream of 7.45, the receptor and the hormone are not as good a match. And so therefore, the signaling process for bone calcium resorption is downregulated and it doesn't work as well. And so as many of you probably do, and as most of you probably have heard, we've increasingly moved to trying to have dry cow, particularly close up dry cow, last three weeks, close up dry cow rations be slightly acidic or acidogenic. And so we feed anionic salts in a variety of ways, commercial versions of it, and you know magnesium sulfate and calcium chloride and a whole variety of different salt blend mixtures. And the, what we're doing to those cows is we're literally feeding them more acid in their ration so that we lower their total body pH very slightly, and we're doing it deliberately so that parathyroid hormone is most effective and calcium will be effectively mobilized out of bone. One other piece of that puzzle is the same hormone system not only requires that the receptor and parathyroid hormone match up, but the, the chain of events below that require magnesium. And so if you haven't, if you've done everything right, but your close-up dry cow ration is low in magnesium, you still have problems. So for us in our rations, and I'm suspicious it's even more of a problem for you because of the degree that you feed small grain and grass silages, our problem, the, the sort of major uh, enemy in this process is potassium. So many of your forages, many of our forages, uh, particularly grass haze and other haze, uh, are high potassium forages. Potassium is, it counteracts the effect of trying to, to acidify the cow. It basically, because of the, the, the organics that go along with it. Um, potassium is a buffer. It tends to make cows more basic, less acidic. And so at high potassium diets tend to make it very hard to acidify the cow enough to help 
prevent the hypocalcemia. It's also true, magnesium is only absorbed in the cow through the rumen wall. It's very poorly, if at all, absorbed further down in the intestinal tract. And potassium in the rumen competes for the same, basically, doors, if you will, out of the rumen into the cow. So if you have a high potassium diet and you have not fed adequate magnesium in the diet, then you can end up with a diet that otherwise looks fine, but the cow then is marginally hypomagnesemic, and now you've got the same problem that the cow has trouble getting calcium out of her bones, not because she's not acidic enough, but because she's low in magnesium. So my general thumb rule, you've got good nutritionists to ask them what their thumb rules is, but my general thumb rule is that magnesium should always be one quarter of the concentration of potassium, at least. So four to one ratio, potassium to magnesium. Pretty easy to, to achieve. Mag oxide does a good job of it, except it's a buffer. Mag sulfate in a close-up dry cow is probably a better choice because it's acidifying, but you have to make sure there's enough magnesium there as well. And so the third arm of this, we've got hypocalcemia, we've got low energy and maybe low uh, protein balance, and now we've got immune suppression. Both of those, hypocalcemia, low calcium, and low energy, make the immune system work more poorly. Cows retain their placentas because their immune systems don't work. We used to think that they retain their placentas when they had milk fever because the uterus doesn't squeeze hard enough to push the placenta out. We now know that that's not the case maybe tiny part of the case, but fundamentally there's the cow's placenta and the, and, and the cow's own uterine wall and they're connected at the cotyledons. What detaches the cotyledon is an immune response. Literally white cells have to go in and suddenly recognize the placenta as not being the same as the cow and, and elicit an immune response that causes the detachment of the placenta. So if you have immune suppression in cows, your, your rate of retained placenta will go up, and that same cow with a suppressed immune system then is far more likely to get metritis, as any of you know, because you get a retained placenta, there's about a 70% chance the cow's gonna get metritis. So immune function is very important in that event, but it's also important in terms of metritis. It's important about early postpartum mastitis. Uh, we periodically see, particularly in first calf heifers, flare-ups of what I call daycare disease. It's they're in a large herd and there's certainly viruses floating around and they're well vaccinated, but we suppress enough of their immune system and one virus or another sort of works through. They get a day or two of fever and even if we don't treat them, they finally get over it. It's like having your kid at daycare. All of those are basically results of an immune system that's not working as well as it should. And hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia contribute, low energy balance contributes, but very important to understand that there are a lot of other things that contribute to poor functioning of the immune system beyond the two of negative energy balance and negative calcium balance. And those are low selenium levels, low vitamin E levels, um, and then all the other things that are stressors and are gonna cause cortisol release and otherwise distract the immune system so that it's less effective. So cows that are uncomfortable and either hot, so Saudi Arabia's got the problem of heat stress. I got the feeling that heat stress is not as big a deal here as in Saudi Arabia. Um, <laughs> cold and wet might be an issue here in Glasgow. Uh, Cows that are overcrowded, competing for food, dirty, uh, competition, mixing cows and heifers in the, in the pre-fresh or the postpartum area, lack of water, um, poor limited feed, limited bunk space, not pushing up feeds, moldy feeds, aflatoxins. There are a whole host of other factors that may come in play on your dairies in terms of uh, immune response. So those are the three final common pathways and they're all amenable to work with feeding program and general cow management and if they can be reduced, you will see less disease and you'll see less of the downstream complications of postpartum transition cow diseases. So now I'm gonna shift gears a little to economics. I have a, an MBA as well as a veterinary degree and I do a lot of uh, looking at the economics of disease and dairy decision management and things of that sort. Um, and so why would we do an economic analysis? I am absolutely convinced that the purpose of an economic analysis is to inform the decision maker. It is, some people think, oh, well, I'll do a spreadsheet and it'll tell me whether it's profitable and then I'll know what I'm gonna do. It doesn't work that way. Decisions are made for a whole host of reasons, typically, and economics is one of them. 
I'm an advocate of having good economics so that you are, make a more informed decision, not because it's going to make the decision, but at least you're finally informed. Um, having said that, a rough estimate is generally enough to to paint the picture you need as a dairyman when you're making decisions. It really doesn't matter whether the cost of a case of metritis is $227.38 or $228.15. Okay? They're really the same. We're trying to inform the decision-making process. So for a defined clinical disease, metritis, mastitis, whatever, we can make an estimate about the cost of those single cases. Uh, treatment costs obviously get involved, so drugs and labor and milk discard and veterinary services. Commonly lost milk production is at least as big a cost of disease, although it's often sort of invisible. It's milk you didn't get. Um, increased risk of culling and death obviously plays a, por a role. Increased impact on reproduction and performance, mastitis, all of those things. And the total for all of the cases can then be based on, well, how much of it do you have? But I'll come back to you in a minute. The problem with doing these kind of economic analyses is they're very dependent on market and price conditions. So a year ago, the cost of metritis was higher than it's going to be for you people, you poor people, uh, this year. I've heard about your milk prices. Um, because milk's not worth as much. You'll lose as much milk, but you don't lose as much money in an odd and sort of twisted and ironic way because, <laughs> because the stuff you got to sell isn't worth as much. So, so it is a constantly moving target, and I think generally what you want is you want a general impression of the order of magnitude and what matters and what doesn't. So I'm going to go through a number of examples, and I've tried hard to make all the type on the slides so small there's no chance that any of you could possibly read it. And that way, you know, I'm more than 35 miles from home and I've got slides, so I must be an expert. Um, but if you do the cost of a case of metritis in the United States, and then I went and plugged some, I think I'm still, what am I? Yeah, I, I'm at $300 in the United States for the cost of a case of metritis. You didn't probably think it cost quite that much because it's not what you see. But there's a lot of downstream impacts on milk production, on future reproduction, on risk of culling, and rarely death, not too often. All of those things that trickle into the cost of a case of metritis. So for you, round numbers, if you want to write it on your pad in front of you, probably about 200 pounds per case is the cost of metritis. And I'm at 15, what am I for milk price? $20 milk, so yeah, it's... I'm slightly, I'm about 27p milk, something like that. Um, if you look at, at published literature uh, for costs associated with metabolic diseases, I took the American numbers, um, but what have I got? Retained placenta, about 150 pounds. Uh, displaced abomasum, about 200 pounds. Milk fever, around 200 pounds. Ketosis at 100 pounds. Uh, I dislike ketosis because how you diagnose it drives it so much. But as you can see, you're beginning to, you begin to sort of crowd into the area that sort of independent of which one you pick, diseases of the early, trans, early postpartum period um, are in the 200 pound cost per case kind of range. For us, DAs, different, different analysis, I don't know if I have that. Uh, yeah, so this is mastitis, a case of clinical mastitis on your dairy, probably if you run the, run the numbers, is around 200 pounds cost per case. You didn't think it was that expensive, but it is. Um, if, and part of it, and the reason that it's bigger than you perceive on a day to, or your neighbors perceive on a day-to-day -day basis, is that a lot of the impacts stretch well beyond the, the clinical event itself. So this is milk production after calving for normal and sick cows. The red line are the normal cows. They ramp up and go off in lactation just fine. And the yellow ones are sick for some reason. Uh, the green dots are retained placenta. The, the other line that they all squiggle together is DAs and ketosis. And so you can see those events, whatever happened to that cow around the time of calving lingers out much later than just she's clinically recovered and looks normal, but she's now not as productive a cow. Um, so what's it worth? What milk price have I got here? I'm at 30p. So what does it cost you if you lose a liter of milk in your, 
in your cows. It's actually quite expensive. I'm at about a liter of milk across the whole lactation for you. I'm at 82 pounds. If I adjusted down to 24 instead of 30p, I'd be at about 60, 70 pounds of profit if, if you lose as little as a liter of milk per cow across your whole lactation. Um, the interesting thing about this whole business of healthy cows make more milk over the long term, continuing <coughs> than cows that got sick, um, cows that are going to get sick are already eating less feed. Their dry matter intake is depressed before you see them as clinically ill. In fact, some of the more recent research shows this is cows that are going to be healthy or getting mild or severe metritis. Those metritis cows are eating significantly less feed, and this is all the way out to 21 days, but they were eating less feed before they calved. Let me say that again. They were eating less feed before they calved. Clearly their uterus isn't infected before they calved. Clearly they don't have metritis, but they were already set up to be sick before they calved. So this goes like two weeks before they calved, those cows that were gonna get metritis were already eating less feed. Dry matter intake in the close-up cow is critically important. So you really have to pay attention to all those factors that impact dry matter intake, particularly not overcrowding close-up dry cows, enough bunk space, avoiding competition, water, cow comfort, all of those things that encourage cows to eat more feed. Because if they don't, the ones that are falling behind in that dry matter intake game have set themselves up for negative energy balance, probably hypocalcemia, immune suppression, and diseases after calving. So culling, culling always comes up as a topic. Transition problems significantly increase the risk of culling. Uh, our benchmark typically is that less than 5% of the milking herd should leave the dairy before 60 days in milk, and less than 3% should die before 60 days in milk. Um, if you look at the risk of when cows do leave the herds in, in the United States, this is a I don't know, 600,000 cows and 2,800 herds in Minnesota, you can see the risk of leaving is very pronounced high in early lactation, and then it's Russian roulette through the middle of lactation. I think that's related to skid steer driving skills on the dairy. Um, and then obviously at the end of the lactation, you get poor production culls and things of that sort. Okay, uh, cost of a pre premature death, I've got $470, what bet? That would be like 300 to 350 pounds if a cow leaves the dairy early, not one that you wanted to cull, but one that you were forced to cull, if you will. Um, so it's expensive, and it behooves you to try to avoid those by avoiding transition problems. The effect of peripartum diseases around calving also ripples out for reproductive performance. If you look at just things like what percent of cows are pregnant by 305 days after calving. For those that were never sick in the transition period, I'm running 75% of cows pregnant by that point. And those that were sick around calving, only about 50, 60, depends on the problem, but somewhere 50 to 60% of those are pregnant. So clearly, transition cow early lactation problems, it's not the breeding period, but those problems persist in those cows and lead toward much reduced reproductive performance. This is, I'll just do the right hand graph. The black line is how fast cows get pregnant. Those are normal cows and they start out with nobody pregnant for obvious reasons and then they gradually get more and more pregnant over time. The dotted line is what happens to cows that had a case of mastitis in early lactation. And you wouldn't think, well, you know, so, okay, she had mastitis at 30 days and we treated it and it was successful. Why is it keeping her from getting pregnant at 120 or 150 days of lactation? I'm here to say it does, and it has to do with the whole physiologic setup for the cow and, and the, the effects of early transition problems that linger across the entire lactation. Uh, just a different graph going in the other direction. This is lame cows and early lameness. Obviously, lame, lame cows, we would expect to have poor reproduction because of, of failure to show estrus and things of that sort. But even early lactation lameness that, in theory, they've, they've gotten over continues to have that ripple effect later on. Um, you, you may get price premiums, and so there may be some cost for transition cow disease in terms of mastitis and so, somatic cell counts. Typically not a major issue. Um, 
So if you stand back from the forest now, I can make pretty good estimates of what all these diseases cost, and I've got milk production, I've got the data that I need to do that. On your dairy, or excuse me, on your neighbor's dairy, um, let's go out and we'll count up all the diseases you've had and we'll multiply every case of metritis times 200 pounds and we'll say, wow, you're losing this much money to metritis every year. I don't find that a particularly compelling number because I haven't been on your dairy, but all the other dairies I've ever been on, they're going to have some cases of metritis. So figuring out the total loss to disease on a dairy is sort of an academic exercise in my mind because it's never going to be zero. The important question and the reason for, remember I said the purpose of economics was to inform the decision maker. The purpose of this whole exercise is to try to find out how much money your neighbor is losing on their dairy that they could do something about. So what's the difference between where they are today or this year in terms of disease performance compared to what might be a reasonable and achievable goal? Because that savings is money that potentially could be part of what you'd use to invest to control the problems. So I will call it, for the slide, avoidable loss. You know, if we think that you can have a meet, uh, retained placenta rate of 5% on your dairy and you're currently at 9%, the 4% are avoidable retained placentas and they would save money and maybe some of that money could be invested in fixing or preventing the problem. So, you know, if you, if you know Excel, you can write these spreadsheets that look at all the diseases and calculate the losses from those diseases and look at current actual versus um, reasonable achievable goals, add that all up and say how much money could I spend per cow per year to prevent the transition cow diseases that are preventable. Not to get to zero, but get to some kind of a goal reasonable level. And in my world, when I do this on dairies, it's always over $100 per cow. It's not $100 per sick cow, it's $100 in every cow. So in your world, it's maybe 60 to 80 pounds per cow on a dairy might be a reasonable expectation of how much more profit you could have per cow if you were controlling, if your neighbors were controlling metabolic transition cow diseases to a point of a reasonable and achievable goal. So it's significant money on a dairy to address these kinds of problems. So everyone then says, what are my goals for disease rates? And um, <clears throat> since I have God-given clairvoyance, I know exactly what, no, I don't. Um, the goal should be set generally, and this is what I'd say to veterinarians who do this or other, or other uh, consultants, advisors, the goal should be set in con conversation with a dairy. At the simplest level, the goal is better than now. Now, at some point, you get close enough to anything you're ever going to do and you relax and go work on something else on the dairy because you're not trying to achieve perfection. If you are, you're probably distracted from important other problems. But for many diseases, you can look at epidemiologic studies, you can look at the prevalence in the average dairy, you can look at the performance of elite dairies, and you can get some sense of what's going on. All of this presumes that your neighbor's dairy has an effective disease recording system, that they actually write down when cows get sick and they keep track of it so that you can, you can monitor it. Economically, going from really bad to pretty okay is, is more valuable than going from pretty okay to really excellent. It's a law of diminishing returns. The last 1% of retained placentas may not be worth chasing, but the first 5% that you can really change would be. So these are numbers, and I'm, it's small enough that thankfully you can't read them, but if you want the slide, you can obviously get it. Um, but you can set some kind of goal incidence. You can look at what it really is in your world, and you can do a, some kind of a pretty quick back of the envelope kind of evaluation of how much is that costing you per, per year, and therefore, if you have to you know, redesign your close-up free stalls is it worth doing if you have to separate the pen so heifers and cows are not in the same pen, is it worth doing? Are there ration changes? Do you need to feed anionic salts or go to a low energy, high fiber diet? All of those questions can be done in the context of understanding how much money you're currently losing that you could get back if you better controlled metabolic and transition cow diseases. Okay. So for many dairies, improving transition management could significantly improve production, reduce culling and death, and reduce the incidence of diseases. And there are ways to estimate that economic impact, as I've alluded to. Um, 
Improving your transition cow program is forever an ongoing process. You're never done at that because things slip, there's protocol drift, there's new forages, there's new conditions on your dairy all the time. So it's a constant management uh, controlling process. Um, and so do as well as you can now and then look for better ways to improve in the future. And because I think I've stayed on time, um, no hook has appeared that I can find, I'd like to thank you all very much for this chance to come to Scotland and speak with you today. It's a delight for me to be here. And uh, when we're all done all of this, my wife and I are gonna go wander around Scotland and spend copious quantities of American money and leave it here in the Scottish economy. Um, <laughs> So thank you very much, I appreciate it.